Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I've been thinking about um, when I started giving talks. <laughs> I can't remember. Maybe it was uh, in the 60s. Yeah. In the in this in the mid 60s, I started giving talks, and then it, it came to a point. Oh, I got a job at uh, Sonoma State University in the psychology department, I can't hear anything. and was the beginning of humanities, just the beginning. So they accepted my course, and uh, Regan was the president. So I had to disguise the course. We called it. Uh, a Chinese identity, <laughs> and uh, a, a little bit psychology of Zen, which was actually Zazen. And they, uh, the, the faculty encouraged me to wear my robes when, when I went on campus. And it was uh, kind of a Renaissance time. Every, everyone was very open and uh, things were happening, uh, terrible things were happening in the world. In the 60s, at the same time, uh, there's this uh, real bad things and some good things always happening together. And, and this is what we should notice. Bad things are happening right now. And same same time, this seemingly good thing is happening. But they juxtapose each other and they, they're rubbing each other. And they're closer than you think. Because it not only affects our lives, but every every human being is affected by not knowing how this works. And so, uh, over, over the years, uh, I was actually um, a pretty shy kind of person and didn't talk very much. The first 10 years at the San Francisco Sazen Zen Center, I didn't say very much. In fact, I hardly spoke to anybody. So I was uh, very fortunate. I got a job at the uh, Sonoma University and, and I taught these courses and it helped me uh, talk. The, the, I was trying to practice the art of talking. I mean, when I went out to dinner with my wife, I didn't say anything. <laughs> when we went to a movie, I didn't say anything. So, you know, maybe, actually that's probably how men are or some women are too. But you wanna have some conversation, like the, was the meal good or was it, wasn't it good? But some some exchange is, is dialogue is, natural right so that the person the other person knows where you are you but you're there and you didn't like the dessert but you were there and so you have this exchange so now so at, at the snow state university i had to talk a lot and uh first thing i asked suzuki roshi if it was uh, all right if I took this job. And the first thing he said, you're not a good teacher. <laughs> and we just correct. <laughs> Which is very correct, especially when you are you gonna teach Zen? How can you teach Zen? And then uh, he realized that I was uh, very sensitive to his comment. So he said, oh, well maybe, how much money are you gonna make? <laughs> And then um, he said, maybe I should change my job, <laughs> become, become a teacher. So uh, during those years, it was uh, in, the, in the 60s before Tassahara, uh, I, had, I had these classes and had to give talks and I had to say something. Now, what do you, what do you say to 60, uh, university students who are in the psychology department every day or every other day of the week for, 
I don't know how many months. And we were kind of in a stream of consciousness. Just open your mouth and all these words came out. And it lasted a, quite a long time, but some someday that stream of consciousness, whatever it is, stream of creativity, it'll run out, you become dry. And then that's, that's, you have to make the next step. And so over the years, I was thinking, uh, and then I was Shuso at Tassajara. That was the year that Roshi died, 1971. I had, and because I had given all these talks, it was a little bit easier for me to give a talk at, in the Zendo at Tassajara. But uh, it was, you know, it's giving a talk or playing, whether you like it or not. You have to be there and you have to perform or be there. And something happens during those many, many years. It's not, it's even not by choice that you do what you do when something is very serious. You don't say, I'm going to choose this. It chooses you, where you know that you have to do something and you do it. You have to do it. It's, it was for me, uh, yeah, Suzuki Roshi saved me saved my life. So I knew I, ha I had to do this. It wasn't by choice at all. So after uh, uh, he died, uh, it was talk after talk and uh, planning and worrying uh, what to say all week, what to say, uh, what to study. Uh, and giving a talk here is it's not enter about entertainment. So most people, maybe, maybe you're shopping. You go to different places and you shop to see, see what looks, looks good to you, but, not, but to your heart is different. Looks good on the outside to you, but in your inner being, that's what you should be looking from. Um, so just, just uh, uh, a couple of weeks uh, and, and a couple of days ago, this uh, st student's uh, a son had an overdose. And it was very, uh, for the mother, uh, it was very tragic. It was very hard to give up her only son. And uh, she said that it's better not that we talk because as soon as we on the phone or on Zoom, I'll just keep crying. And then she wrote a second email and said something about the word never. And I thought about the word never and the words we use every day. Never is never. But there's no such thing as never because never can't be never because things are impermanent. Things are moving and changing. And so underneath that, I said, never is actually ever so it's forever but not never in a negative sense but it's forever it has never has the same mother we all have all dichotomies have the same mother all people have the same mother the co said that uh Dogs don't fight over, over food when they eat if they have the same mother. But foolishly, humanity doesn't know that we have the same mother. We shouldn't be fighting. So an, another person, uh, he, he said uh, he was sick for a long time. And he had never been sick before. So these are people's lives. And when he was feeling uh, very much in despair and going downhill, he said to himself, who is the one that does not get sick? Who is the one who is not sick? 
And I think that saved him. And the same same time, another friend, uh, he's uh, dealing with his taxes. He says he's in a psychological, psychic uproar. And I said, but behind that, when you look closely, it's the same mother. We all have the same mother. And I, I forget even uh, there was a, uh, when we did fire watcher during Ango, our practice period, uh, it was my turn to carry the sticks and the, the fire watch, you, you kind of circumambulate the property. And everyone was mentioning that uh, down by the orchard, it's a very dark area. And uh, they get really frightened when they go there, when they pass through there. Even even on when it's full moon, it's still very dark, but you walk through that area. And every every step, uh, every eight steps, you you hit the kashak with the sticks. So that means go to sleep, put the fire, all fires are out, and uh, be safe. So then it came my turn. And so when I approached the area, it, my heart started beating very fast. And I said, maybe it's true. Maybe it is Bigfoot lives here or something. <laughs> and then I was very fortunate that this uh, truth came out. It said to the fear, you have no origin. Despair has no origin. Psychiatric energy has no origin. All of the stuff has no origin. That plagues us and makes us worry and afraid and, and really disrupts our lives. But on the other side is, is the bright brightness. So, uh, I mean, this is this is also Buddha Dharma. To to in in your zazen practice, when you sit, the opposites dissolve. And the only thing you have to do is go to go with people to your cushion and sit down. That's the, all you have to do, and stay there. In the uh, form of a zendo. And even if you're on Zoom, take the form of the Zendo, not take the form of your personal self, because that's 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 uh doesn't get you anywhere. It gets you in a lot of trouble and causes a lot of problem. And you sit there, and what happens is that those um, opposites are there and they're created by your thinking mind. And you know, the phrase Tathagata Zen is very important for us to know. Tathagata means thus come, thus gone. Coming and going, it's the opposites again. And so just saying Buddha is one side, but Tathagata is the opposites again, coming, going, and how to unify. In fact, the skandhas, which is the fabrication of our egos and self that we chant every day, the five skandhas, uh, the Chinese uh, character is five, in Japanese is pronounced go un, and un also means bundle. And skandhas means uh, your small mind, the scattering, the mind that makes you scatter makes you suffer and if we don't know that I, I we entertain it and we create our own suffering basically no one else does but there's a bundle in the scattering so that's very interesting uh outside of our living room there's a pistachio tree it's green and in the fall it turns a bright red but there's always one leaf that's red 
it means the red is already there. When it's light, the dark is already here. They work, they work in concert with each other, but we don't know it. So it's, it's like what we like is in the light. What we don't like, not like is in the dark. We have to know uh, what is it form or form is emptiness. That's, that's like easier for us to understand and experience. But Suzuki Roshi said, uh, emptiness is form. That's more difficult. And why is it more difficult? Because that means it applies straight to our everyday life. Everything that we do is also the form, is, is also emptiness. The words uh, or the psychological things that plague us is also emptiness. It comes from emptiness because we haven't recognized what emptiness is. So, uh, is, don't you find that interesting? The skandhas is, uh, what, are, what are the skandhas? Okay, form, and how does it go? There's four more. Nobody knows. Okay. Feeling. Form, feeling. Mental processes. Discrimination and consciousness. Perception. Perception. That's, that's that. Okay. And and actually, the these five skandhas, uh, these forms, uh, and ideas are also like, like in a heart sutra. It says they are also empty. There's no such thing. There's the behind the scattering mind is the mother. So uh, uh, I think that's beautiful. That, that's like uh, freedom. It's liberation from, from who, who we think we are. If one Roshi explained it, if one completely embraces the skandhas, the opposite of skand the opposite of scattering is there. Because when the mind is scattered, the activity of bundling is apparent. So uh, this is explanation, but in Zazen, we don't think about anything. So we don't think about anything. It happens of itself. We don't have to do anything. That's how powerful Zazen is. Um, what does it say? Oh, like in the Sando Kai, the intimacy of the relative and the absolute, the opposites again. There's the saying, in light, there's darkness but don't try to understand it. In darkness, there's light, but don't look for it. In other words, don't do anything in Zazen. It's kind of interesting, huh? Because we're always doing something. This is, you're not doing anything, but that's also very difficult to do. It takes sitting after sitting after sitting. So, so in another way, uh, a seemingly a destructive or negative activity has a very positive, constructive activity behind it, right with it. But we don't know it, so we 
become disturbed or frustrated or anxious in our everyday life. But with the repetition, the power of zazen, it begins to unify the opposites that cause our suffering. And basically, this is the Buddha Dharma's function, is to relieve, to liberate us from our suffering. <laughs> Actually, this Buddha said this nearly, it's nearly now 2,600 years ago in his proclamation of truth. Do you, do you find that interesting uh, when you hear that? To unify, dissolve the opposites. This is our job. And the Chinese uh, call us the Takata. They call us the Takata. The Takata is the victorious one. You are finally a champion, a real champion. It, <laughs> Our champions are athletes or uh, basketball players or movie stars, but this is, this is the victorious one. There's no doubt about it. Abhidharma. Abhidharma means uh, advanced, highest. Uttama, Uttama means the advanced, highest. Ati means pinnacle. Abhidharma. Oh, I wanted to uh, tell you uh, an experience I had uh, probably last night after uh, Zazen. I, I, um, since I've been talking about Echo Hensho, um, taking the backward step and uh, turn, turn the light this way, turn the light, and then return the light to everything. And so I had an idea of uh, what it was like. So what happened to me was that, and someone sent me a, a photograph from Canada about Echo Hensho, and it was, the, I sent it out to a few people. It's the morning dawn, the, the morning light, dawn. And um, dawn, and when the sun sets, the twilight zone uh, uh, cast a very beautiful light that's not seen during the day. And that's when artists or photographers take pictures or because the light is very rare. So I was, uh, my, my idea of the universe, uh, was heightened because Zen, there are many sayings about Zen that we, everyone has a jewel in their, in their clothes, but they don't know that jewel, that very jewel revealed is, is the light of the whole universe. It's that bright and that powerful. And, and the photograph connected me to the universe, you know, nature, but it's big. It's bigger than you could ever think. So what I did was that uh, after, uh, oh, during Zazen, I can see the reflection of the sun setting. The west, the sun, this is east, this is west, setting uh, behind me and it started casting uh, rays of light uh, first on, on my left side of the face of my shoulder and it, th these rays they were colored rays 
and they went in front of me as well as back in the sides. These rays, a shaft is big, but these were rays of light streaming down from as the sun was setting. And so uh, uh, pe people, <laughs> people make movies or tell stories about the sunset and the shaft of light, but that's, we're not interested. I mean, it is beautiful, but it's more than beauty. It's Echo Henschel. The universe is showing us, revealing us something very important. And that importance is the light within ourselves. So I sat there, but I was expecting something else. I was looking, I had an idea. I was looking for something else. And then, uh, and then it got darker and darker and everything began disappearing and it became black. And I said, I, I said, oh, no. I, I didn't say anything, but I said something's missing because, and then I thought about uh, the next next morning that uh, I must have missed it. <laughs> but even missing it, even worrying about it, even lying about it, even hating about it, is the mud behind it. I mean, it's that it's that wonderful. But you have to practice zazen with it to, to have this kind of experience. So Inmo is Dogen's uh, Shobogenzo. And Inmo is uh, this is Nishijima's uh, translation. It's just the word it. So I'll, I'll read you some of this, but I decided to read you some of this because it's so beautiful, his writing. Uh, not, not just beautiful or poetic, but uh, the depth is profound, deep and steep. Inmo is an informal Chinese word and it means it could be that or what. We usually use the words it, that, or what to indicate something that do, we don't need to explain. So Buddhist philosophers in China use the word Inmo to suggest something ineffable can't explain. At the same time, one of the aims of studying Buddhism is to realize reality. And according to Buddhist philosophy, reality is something ineffable. So the word inmo was used to indicate the truth or reality, which in Buddhist philosophy was originally ineffable. So in this chapter, Master Dogen explains the meaning of Inmo and quotes other Zen masters as Ungon Doyo, Sogyananda, Daikan Eno, Sekito Kisen, and others. Yeah, I'll skip a little bit, but in other words, those who want to attain the matter, which is it, must themselves be the people who are it. This is very beautiful. They are already people who are it. It means you have it. Why should they worry about attaining the matter, which is it? The point of this is that directing oneself 
straight for the supreme truth of Bodhi is described. For the present as it. The situation of this supreme truth or Bodhi is such that even the whole universe in the 10 directions is just a small part of the supreme truth of Bodhi. It may be that the truth of Bodhi abounds beyond the universe. We ourselves are just tools which it possesses within the universe of the 10 directions. How do we know that it exists? We know it is so because the body and the mind both appear in the universe. Yet neither is ourselves. I, I'll read this again. We know it is because that the body and the mind both appear in the universe, yet neither is ourselves. The body already is not you, is not I. <laughs> that sentence really grabbed me. Your body is not yours. Because if it was yours, you could, could control it. You can't control it. You can't make it do what you want because we are aging every day, every second, every instant. The cosmetic factory would go bankrupt. But look at, um, so the body already is not I. It's life moves on through the days and months, and we cannot stop it even for an instance. Where have the red faces of our youth gone? When we look for them, they have vanished without a trace. When we reflect carefully, there are many things in the past we will never see again. The sincere mind, too, does not stop, but goes and comes moment by moment. Although the state of sincerity does exist, it is not something that lingers in the vicinity of the personal self. <laughs> Great, isn't it? Although the state of sincerity does not exist is not something that lingers in the vicinity of the personal self. Even so, this is this is in Inmo again. There is something which in our form uh, in our limitlessness establishes the body mind. Once this mind is established, abandoning. Once this mind is established, abandoning our former playthings. This is the big sentence. What do you have to abandon to practice? And even abandon while you are practicing. It's a lot of playthings. We hope to hear what we have not heard before. We seek to experience what we have not experienced before. This is not solely our own doing. Remember, it happens like this because we are people who are it. How do we know that we are people who are it? We know that we are people who are it just from the fact that we want to attain the matter which is it. Already we possess the real features of a person who is it. We should not worry about the already present matter, which is it. Even worry itself 
is just the matter which is it. And so it is beyond worry. Even worry itself is just the matter which is it. And so it is beyond worry. Again, we should not be surprised that the matter which is it is present in such a state. Even if it is the object of surprise and wonderment, it is still just it. And there is it about which we should not be surprised. This state cannot be fathomed even by the consideration of Buddha. It cannot be fathomed even by the consideration of a mind. It cannot be fathomed by the consideration of the Dharma worlds. And it cannot be fathomed by consideration of the whole universe. It can only be described. Already you are a person who is it. Why worry the matter which is it? Thus, the suchness of sound and form. Suchness is more, uh, well, a positive way of saying emptiness. Thus, the emptiness of sound and form may be it. The example, the time, uh, here, here's an example now. The time of getting, of falling down on the ground, we understand as it is, as it. And the very moment when we get up, inevitably we're lying on the ground. Here, in this instance, we do not wonder that the falling down was on the ground. These are words that have been spoken since ancient times, have been spoken from the Western heavens, have been spoken from the heavens above. They are, if we fall down on the ground, we get up again on the ground. If we seek to get up apart from the ground, that is in the end impossible. In other words, those who fall down on the ground inevitably get up on the ground. And if they want to get up without relying on the ground, they can never do so at all. I'll just read two more paragraphs and probably go on with the same subject. Taking up what is described Thus, we have seen it as the beginning of attaining a great realization. And we have made it into a state of truth that sheds body and mind. Therefore, if someone asks, what is the principle of Buddha's realization of the truth? What is the principle of Buddha's realization of truth? We say, it is like someone who falls to the ground, getting up on the ground. Mastering this principle, we should penetrate and clarify the past. We should penetrate and clarify the future. And we should penetrate and clarify the very moment of the present. Great realization and non-realization, returning to delusion, and losing the state of delusion, being restricted by realization itself and being restricted by delusion itself. Each of these is the truth that someone who falls to the ground gets up relying on the ground. It is an expression of truth in the heavens above and everywhere under the heavens is an expression of the truth of the Western heavens and the Eastern lands is an expression of the truth in the past, present, and future, and is the expression of the truth of old Buddhas and new Buddhas. This expression of the truth is never imperfect 
in expression and does not lack anything in expression. Even so, it seems to me that only to understand words like that without also understanding them in a way not like that is to fail to master these words. There's, there's the opposite again. We only see things or understand things like that, but we don't understand things that are not like that. Understand is objective. It's it's in light, not not the sense in the dark. We we only know what we can see and understand. So th this is really critical. It's it's about the opposites again. Uh, like this, not like this. These two are very important to know how to resolve. So even so, it seems to me, Dogen, that only to understand words like that without also understanding them in a way which is not like that is to fail to master these words. Although the expression of truth of an eternal Buddha has been transmitted like that, still when eternal Buddhas listen as eternal Buddhas to words of eternal Buddhas, there should be an ascendant state of listening. Though never spoken in the Western heavens and never spoken in the heavens above, there is another truth to be expressed. It is that if those who fall down on the ground seek to get up by relying on the ground, even if they spend countless kalpas, they will never be able to get up. They can get up by means of just one vigorous path. That is, those who fall down through reliance on the ground inevitably get up relying on the void. And those who fall down through reliance on the void inevitably get up relying on the ground. Unless it is like this, getting up will, in the end, be impossible. The Buddhists and ancestors were all like this. Suppose a person asks like this, how far apart are the void and the ground? This is a good question. <laughs> I mean, you could say how far, how far apart are the uh, sky and the ground? It's right where you are. It's, it's not out there. I asked this to one of my granddaughters and she said it was some, some number, she says science majors, so 153,000 miles or something. If someone asked a question like this, we should answer the person like this. This is Dogen, the void and the ground are 108,000 miles apart. <laughs> he, we, we thought he would give some, uh, not such a concrete answer, but he did. When we fall down through reliance on the ground, we inevitably get up relying on the void. If we seek to get up apart from the void, it will be impossible at last. When we fall down through the reliance on the void, we inevitably get up 
relying on the ground. And if we seek to get up apart from the ground, it will be impossible at last. Someone who has never spoken such words has never known and has never seen the dimensions of the ground nor the void in Buddhism. <laughs>